Born in Trenton, Ontario, Elizabeth Manley began skating at an early age. From the ages of 10 to 15, Manley ascended within the national skating program, becoming the Canadian national champion. Just a short time later, her longtime coach, Bob McAvoy, couldn't coach her anymore, thus closing the door to competing at her first Olympics. Shortly thereafter, Skate Canada contacted Manley and offered to train her in Lake Placid with a new coach. The separation from home ignited change, causing a breakdown, and she was diagnosed as clinically depressed. Once again, Manley was approached, and this time by Peter and Sonia Dunfield, who together convinced Elizabeth to skate again, a decision that would change her life for good. She trained with the Dunfields in Ottawa and was soon headed to the 1984 Olympics in Sarajevo. She finished 13th. Manley's crowning achievement arose at the Calgary 1988 Olympic Winter Games, where she earned her place with silver medal and a performance that could be described as the best of her life. She entered Canada's Sports Hall of Fame in 2014 and continues to be an ambassador of sorts to speak about the importance of recognizing and talking about mental illness and is an inspiration for Canadians everywhere. Well, it seems funny to start because we've already been talking for quite some time and I am so thrilled that you have come all the way from Ottawa for this interview. So, but let me start here. This is something that, that you speak of a lot. You say, I won the silver in Calgary, but I won the gold in life. And I, I want to pack, unpack that as it pertains to your, your journey. Well, it's a long <laughs> journey. Um, you know, my my skating career and my life was very roller coastery. It was up and down, up and down. And I went through a really difficult time in 1983, which was before the Sarajevo Olympics. And um, it's like kind of everything around me was falling apart. Not so much on the ice, but everything around me. My mom struggling to keep me in a sport. Um, my coach ended up leaving me. Um, at the time, I didn't understand why he left me. And later on to find out that he was very ill and uh, he only had a certain amount of time left to live. And he loved me so much that he wanted me to go on without him. And he used this excuse that he wasn't good enough to take me to an Olympics, which I knew was crazy because in four years he made me a national champion. So. Um, so a lot of things kind of happened and I ended up getting sent away to Lake Placid. And at the time I remember when I got told that, you know, the association Skate Canada was gonna send me away to train. I remember saying to my mom, the, the United States, that's this really weird, strange country. It's, it's far away, right? And my mom started laughing. She said, no, it's only like three hours away. <laughs> so I had no idea, right? But I think being, taken away from home at a young age. I was in what I thought was a strange country and being left by myself with, my mom wasn't there, my dad was living in Europe with the Air Force, my brothers were all off playing hockey. And in those days, you know, we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have computers, we didn't have way before your time, but um, I ended up living in an attic of this lady's house. And I am um, within about three months, I, I didn't feel like anything was wrong, but suddenly my body started to give out. And um, long story short, within a period of about three months, I gained about 50 pounds in water retention, just swelling. I couldn't even get my skates on. My feet were so swollen and I lost all my hair. I went bald and I was 16 years old. And so when I, my mom came and got me, she pulled me away. She said, sport isn't worth this. And you know, a typical, you know, very, um, kind of a protective mom and um, we went from specialist to specialist in Ottawa and oh I was tested for everything nobody knew what was wrong with me and then I finally got into a specialist and that was the day I was diagnosed as having a nervous breakdown and having depression. I mean mental health has such a stigma oh, now uh, yes but back in 1983 I mean what did that do to you? Did you have any indication leading up to that that you were struggling with with moods or depression? You know, I, I really didn't feel I was, but when I look back at it now, um, I was training in the U.S. I didn't have a lot of friends in the rink because I hate to say this, I could skate better than them. So this 
girl from the strange country, Canada, comes and moves into their home <laughs> and starts training there. My coach didn't speak English. He was from Austria. So it was a lot of manipulation with body parts and everything. I couldn't call home because in those days, long distance didn't really, you know, have any plans at all. I really kind of shut down and, you know, I wasn't able to talk to people. I wasn't, you know, socializing with anybody. And I am, um, the only way that my body could tell me that something was wrong was to physically break down. And that's what the specialist told me. One of the greatest sayings that exists in figure skating is take your tears out in the parking lot. Don't let anybody see you cry. And so that's kind of how I was raised. And so I was keeping everything inside. And really what's really interesting about this whole story is when I ended up quitting skating and I ended up getting help. Somebody reached out to offer me help. And I remember saying no at the beginning. And my mom started to cry and she said, please, you know, will you get this help? And, and I remember being 16 years old, bald, you know, my life was over because I only knew skating and I didn't think anybody could help me. And so I really wanted to take care of myself. And it was that night, and I'm, I'm not afraid to say it now, I, I think I was a few years ago, but that was the night I remember sitting in my bedroom and I was that typical teen that I really felt the world would be better without me. And those thoughts went through my head. And that's why I can understand how teens feel today, because when you're beaten down and when you think you have nowhere to go in life or you have no goals or so forth, you, you start to think in, in that dark area. And I remember the next morning I woke up and I had been thinking about this all night, you know, my family would be better off without me, the skating world would be better off without me, I've just caused so many problems, I've hurt so many people, I've disappointed, all these things. And that's when I got mad. I got mad at myself. And I said, no, I'm not going to let this defeat me. And so I went for the help. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm trying to make a long story short, but, you know, five sessions turned into hundreds, turned into me being presented that Olympic uniform in Calgary. And um, I, you know, I sometimes say, and it was Terry Orlick, who's one of the best sports psychologists, and Peter Jensen as well worked with me. And, uh, there would be no Elizabeth without them and there would be no Elizabeth without the city of Ottawa because they supported me and they backed me and um, always made me feel like I was going to be okay. When you talk about your resilience, you talk about getting mad and how yeah. you really needed that sort mm -hmm. of to propel you throughout your career, many Absolutely. instances. Um, how did, how did you get there? Like, how do you think you mentally flipped to that? I think I'm such a people pleaser. <laughs> I really do. I think it's, it's, it's probably a bit of a downfall in me, but I always want people to be happy and I always want people to be proud of me and I always want people to be pleased with me and things like that. And I, and I think what it, where that energy came from was just determination. Now, I don't know if it was growing up with three older brothers that were hockey players and I was always like trying to fight, fight them off. You know what I'm saying? I became a bit of a, a, a tomboy, tough girl with my brothers, but um, I think it was just something that was in my head saying, I'm going to prove everyone wrong. I'm going to prove everyone wrong. And that would motivate me. And I remember in 85, I think it was, um, my national title was taken away from me because another skater was a big story for their comeback. And I remember my mom in tears packing up my skate bag. She couldn't believe it. I had outskated them and she just couldn't believe that they took my title away. And we're driving all the way home from North Bay and she's, you know, got a few choice words to say in the car. And, uh, I, you know, this sport, I don't think you should be in it and everything. And I remember, you know, I gave myself 24 hours to cry and to realize I wasn't the national champion anymore and to think things through. And then I got mad again and trained my butt off because I knew world championships was in a month. And I ended up doing my best placement ever and I beat our national champion. And you know, it's almost like a, a, a something that just motivates me. So your career could have been derailed at so many points, obviously yeah. um, your mental health is a very serious issue yes. and you have been able to work through that you get to the olympics in calgary right. and you end up first of all a, a local paper in ottawa writes kind of a, a damning report about yeah. your mental health right um so that's gotta shake you yeah and then you have a fever in uh, 100, yeah. 103 whatever you name it, i had it <laughs> so i mean at that moment i mean how did you even go on with the show let alone medal <sighs> well it's um because 
the newspaper article had come out, it literally took me back four years to when I had gone through the depression. It just sucked all that work that I had done, all that confidence that I had built up and everything. I always knew that I could win, you know, figure skating is a very political sport. I was up against some tough girls, you know, Katarina Witt from East Germany, Debbie Thomas from the U.S. And, but I always knew deep down that, that I could beat these girls. And then when this article came out, I, I literally locked myself in my bedroom for three days and didn't show up for training. And this was like a week and a half before I was to leave for Calgary. And because it mentally took such a toll on me, I got really sick. I got the flu. And you know, he can't take anything. You know, the drug testing in amateur sports is, you know, at its highest. And so when I was going to a doctor, they'd start writing me prescriptions. I'm like, I can't take anything, you know? So it was really try to get healthy on my own. When I did get to Calgary, um, I got worse and I was spontaneously drug tested, which never happens, you know, in those days in skating, you, you, you know, drug testing always happens after the final event. I was spontaneously drug tested because they were suspicious. And after the short program, my fever spiked and we went into a meeting and the organization and, you know, Olympic Canada and everything felt probably wasn't best for me to continue. They didn't think I could make it through. Wow. And I remember crying and saying, I don't know who any of you are, but you're deciding my life at two o'clock in the morning after the short program. I have a day off tomorrow and I'm just asking for my day off. And so they said, OK, but you have to let us know by tomorrow if you're going to continue because we have to send it out to the media. And um, I went out on the practice and my fever was high and my coach said, we're just going to you're just going to skate. No jumps, no spins. We're going to sweat it out and then we'll make the decision. And when I was on the ice, every girl's dream happened. But the entire Olympic hockey team walked into my practice. <laughs> <laughs> and when I mean they walked in, they walked right into the ice. They sat in their player's box and their coach, who I didn't know, had his arms. He was sitting like this behind them and none of them were talking to each other. And I remember thinking to myself, one, why are they here? Katarina Vitt's not on the ice. <laughs> Two, why are the hockey players at my practice? You know, because you never see hockey players at figure skating practices. And um, so my coach said, can we concentrate? And I said, you know, I'm so sick that they're not doing anything for me. I'm just curious why they're here. Finished 20 minutes, my coach hands me my sweater. He says, we're gonna have a meeting and we're gonna go upstairs to the press room and we're gonna make a decision. I said, okay, so as I came off the ice, the team stood up and walked out. And as I came around, I could see them getting into their bus at the back of the saddle dome. And I was still shaking my head going, why were they here? I just can't figure it out. And as I came around the corner, the lights were really low to save power. And the coach was walking towards me, who I didn't know from the hole in the wall. And I thought, I looked around, there was nobody else in the corridor. And I thought, well, I better say something to him. So I walked up to him and I said, hi, I'm Elizabeth Manley. And he goes, hi, I'm Dave King. And he goes, I know who you are. And I started to smile and I said, I, I got to thank you for coming to support me on my practice. But I got to ask you why? Like, <laughs> you know, I just flat out asked him. I said, why was a hockey team at my practice? And he said, Elizabeth, the team's waiting for me in the bus. I've got to run. He said, but we were practicing next door and we weren't having a good practice. And I felt the best thing I could do for them was to pull them off the ice and make them come watch a champion. And I literally, Tara, I literally, I was looking around to see if Katarina or somebody was behind me. And I'm like, what? Like, and he said, good luck tomorrow. And thanks for inspiring my boys like this. And he walked away and I was in such shock that I bent over and I was just like, wow, somebody just called me a champion. Mm -hmm. Now I hear it from my parents. I hear it from my coaches. I hear it from my sports psychologists, but this was somebody I had never met, didn't know anything and he just gave me this massive compliment and right at that moment my coach came around the corner and I sat up he thought I was throwing up from the flu because I was bent over like this and he goes he goes you okay and I said yeah call the meeting off and he said what do you mean I said call the meeting off I'm going to skate tomorrow no matter what and he goes are you sure like what just happened and I said one day I'll tell you and I didn't even share it with him and that was the turning point of my life. Um, he just gave me such a compliment at a time mentally that I need a, you know, if you go to the Olympics, you're good enough to be there. You wouldn't be there if you're there. It's the mental game. It's whoever can hold it together mentally that, that becomes the big stars, right? And um, 
that was all it took was a complete stranger to say that to me. And it, it was a matter of a five second conversation. And um, I went out the next night and did what I did and, you know, changed my life forever. And I honestly, he had no idea, as I was saying to you prior to our interview, he, I did this event in Calgary a few years ago and they Skyped him in from Phoenix to listen to my talk. And I didn't even know he was Skyped in and I finally got to thank him. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you have these very difficult situations that you have culled from and pulled from in order now to help others, which yeah. has really become your raison d'etre, right? Yes, my passion. It really it is, is absolutely my passion. I, I remember right after the Olympics, I wrote a book and I wanted all the proceeds to go to Canadian Mental Health Association. And I, I, I told my whole story. And when I got the final copy back, half the story was missing. And I remember saying, why is this story missing? And well, people aren't ready. They're not ready to put Canada's sweetheart and mental health in the same sentence. And we want the book to sell, right? So it was a little bit, you know, kind of the stigma was so high, it was still being brushed under the carpet. But I thought, okay, you know, we'll do it. And then I would try to speak about it. People would be like, so I'm really happy in this day and age, sitting here today with you, that I can actually speak to a room of a thousand people tell my story, talk about mental health, um, raise awareness of it, and people are listening now. I mean, we have a long way to go still, but we're at least listening now, and we're at least understanding. And, you know, you look at these great people that have come out now and are really talking about it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's important. And I'm just, I'm just blessed that I have this platform of what I did in Calgary to, to actually be able to use that to be able to talk to people and it just got so powerful to me and the people that were coming up to me after every speech it just started to like I gotta do something I want to do something so I went to a life coach because mm. I wanted to kind of find out you know I walked out of there and I bawled my eyes out for an hour sitting on the curb it was right here in Toronto she had such an impact on me that it was just like it's all I needed. It was like that kick in the butt. And the next day I signed up to go back and learn and get my certification and everything. Because I didn't want to be just Liz Manley doing life coaching. That's not what it's about. I wanted really to know it. And when I did this full year of course and working with instructors and working with professors and everything like that, I became stronger and stronger and stronger. And I knew exactly what I needed to do with my life. And that's where I am now. So this might be something that you would say at, at this yeah. Girl Power workshop, but we leave every guest with this question, and that is, um, what is your best advice to a young Liz Manley? And I'm sure you've thought about that a lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's just being you. And one of the things I, I, I say to a lot when I'm coaching skating, and I do power skating and everything, but I always say, you know, don't worry about circumstances you have no control over. That's when you get into trouble. Mm -hmm. Only worry about what you have control over. And what you have control over is yourself. So, you know, for young girls that are being bullied or, you know, in sport where they feel like they're not going to succeed or whatever, if you have enough belief and faith and strength in yourself, miracles can happen. And I'm, I'm the poster child for that. 